So, our third episode of Bible studies for the Korean Presbyterian Church of Pine Ellis Park, the English service. Uh, we will be finishing up lesson one tonight, which is all about the Bible, where we have come with it and from it. Uh, we will ask you all to keep us in your thoughts. It's around the low 50s in Florida. And for me, anything below 80 is a cold snap. So I am certainly not doing well. <laughs> That's okay. why I live here. Okay. I was thinking about moving to South, but that would be Cuba and that doesn't work. So uh, Dave Shah is going to give us an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. And we uh, pray that you will lift our hearts and lift our souls as we uh, gather together in, in worship of you, Lord, and we learn and we study from the Bible, Lord, for energize our minds so that we can grasp the message, Lord, and the understanding and grow internally to grow externally to help others understand, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And we're going to pick it up where we left off, which with my uh, PowerPoint is should be uh, slide 14, I believe. The Bible underline. We're going to look at the who, what, when, where, why, how. Your lesson, you, which I think we, pardon me, grab this one A, right? Yeah, one A. I think so. A slide because I, I think. Oh wait a minute. Oh, maybe that is right. Oh no, wait a minute. Nope, one A is back here. Sorry, I think I was uh, looking at something else. Sorry, my mistake. We went through all of that one. It is 1A. You're right. Here we go. This is what we're supposed to learn. Sorry. And yeah, we should be back a little bit. What one of my uh one of my old timers probably. I put the green arrow in the wrong place. How the Bible became ours. Yes, that's there what we we're go. going to discuss. Uh, and that, that's what we will finish up with today. Uh is a fascinating story of how the Bible came to us. Uh, how it became ours, okay? We know from our first beginning lesson that God was responsible for the Bible. He took men and inspired them to write what he wanted us to know. And there are a lot of things in the Bible to know. There are many, many things in there to guide one's life uh, under many circumstances. We know that there was uh, the first covenant, which is with the Jewish or Israel, and then the second covenant, which is all of us through Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament and New Testament should be seen together because they do play off of each other and one into the other. It is two sections in one book. They both portray Jesus Christ as a central figure in all the scripture. And, and that's, that's very true uh, in these because I can turn to one here. Let's say 1 Samuel. Uh, and it talks about how the goings on during this time period lead into David, and that leads into Christ. So that's through this Bible all the way. This is the New King James Version Study Bible, which has a lot of different uh, pieces of information at the bottom that helps you to understand things. Here we go. 
Christ in the scriptures. First Samuel focuses on the life of David and reveals details that definitely point to the one who would be called by his name. Like Jesus, David is, David is born in the sleepy little village of Bethlehem. His reputation as a shepherd is validated by his years with his father's flock. This, flow, this lowly shepherd becomes the king of the Jews. He is the anointed king who becomes the forerunner of the Messianic kingdom. Through years of struggle and danger, David tastes the kind of rejection Jesus would fully digest. Many of his psalms reveal his firsthand experience of being forsaken. So, each and every one of these books in the Old Testament, they start out with introduction pages that give you all kinds of information. Uh, we've talked about that before. Uh, it'll give you a time frame when they're written. It will give you uh, different names of the books, it will tell you the author of the date, the purpose, and it will always go into Christ in the scripture. So that, that's another thing that's very good about this. Luke 24, 27. Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And Jesus said, the scriptures have been a witness of me. Which is John chapter 5, 39. All the scriptures, Luke, the scriptures have been a witness of me. The books that I use a great deal uh, when researching for knowledge, understanding, and truth. The New King James Version I was using with a course I was studying and my King James Version, or my New International Version, I like in church and services because, it, like I say, it does give me explanations of what's going on down at the bottom, and I, and I like that. And sometimes you can use that to find out if some of the things that are being said or coming at you are real or not, or good or bad, or true or false, or whatever. Um, and sometimes things words are used that those will those uh, in, uh, that information will explain to you. The protection of the manuscripts, the original manuscripts. I don't have it with me, but I have a book <coughs> that lists all of the Protestant denominations throughout the world. Most of which, of course, are in the United States. And it has a list putting them all together in a line so that you can look at each one and go see what differences are. And one of the things they show is what each denomination believes about the Bible. And I when I read that whole list, I found it interesting that about a third to a half of the denominations all believe that the Bible is the Word of God in its original manuscript. Do either of you days know? If there is an original manuscript around anywhere, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, but those aren't the original. I, I cannot really think of anything that I've read or heard that said they have an original manuscript from back in the day when maybe the first one was put together. I have. Yeah. You don't know? No, I was uh, in 1993 in May. They had a museum um, in Washington, D.C. that I attended, and they had the Dead Sea Scrolls there that I was able to look at, but I haven't seen any original. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of find that interesting, that the original manuscript, but I don't know if we've got one anywhere. I may have to do research on that again. Anyway, 
original manuscript, it says some do exist, but I don't know where. I think some older ones do, but not the original. They're handwritten and illustrated by scribes, which is one of the reasons why there weren't as many. And most people, well, everybody outside of clergy or people with a lot of money didn't have Bible at all. They had to learn in church. And of course, it was a tedious situation, which is one of the three ways that some things in Bibles have been changed. One of the three is by accident, by mistake. The scribes were up long hours, tediously, Printing these Bibles by hand, and sometimes it falls. In. Sometimes they lose their place. There are different reasons. That's one of the three. There are some mistakes because of that. Original manuscripts produced between 1500 BC and 100 AD. That's the time frame they're giving us for the original Old Testament manuscripts into the New Testament, which they would not be, you know, uh, the New Testament would not be very old because uh, Christ died on the cross before 70 AD. And the Romans tore down the temple. The manuscripts were in their original language. Translations were also made into other languages and quotations. And therein lies another one of the problems with Bibles and why there are differences in one denomination and the other. I've mentioned this before, but again, competition is mother of knowledge. And the difference between full immersion and sprinkling or baptism. In my NIV Bible, there is a footnote that says with or in water because there's a conflict. Apparently, they cannot come to a specific answer as to what the word that was originally used in some of the other languages like Aramaic and Greek they can't tell exactly what the actual word is. Is it with water or is it in water? So they put them both down. And so that's where you get this, this disagreement between people. Again, and the problem with the Bible is always people, not God. And so there are different different people that go, churches that go off into a different direction and so on, certain things. And that's one of those things. To me, it's easy to understand why people will look to in water, because that's what John the Baptist used. He said he was out in the wilderness. The only thing he had was a river. If he had had a lake, he might have used a lake. But if you do it in a lake and not a river, is it not a good baptism? Well, I don't see any reason why it would not be. So in or with, you know, I'm not settled on, and <clears throat> neither one of them bothered me. So, yeah. so translations were also made into other languages 
uh, and quotation, St. Jerome's Latin translation, also known as the Vulgate. Vulgate meaning Latin. And these Bibles were used a great deal, especially the Catholic Church, because Catholic Mass until only, you know, in the last, what, 30, 40 years, did they start doing Mass in other languages and not just Latin or Latin at all. And of course, Latin was not spoken by the common people. Latin was for scholars, for people who had the money to learn it, uh, for, you know, the, the upper crust, the lords, the ladies, the kings, etc. So Latin was not a common language for people, so the people who didn't have the Bible. Uh, his translation was between 385 and 404. There are various Anglo-Saxon partial translations between 700 to 1000 AD. Anglo-Saxon being the area of England and France and those areas in there. A complete translation by John Wycliffe and his followers, 1382 AD. When uh, a look at this article we do from National Geographic on the Bible. There's some interesting stuff about John Wycliffe. This article was in the December 2011 issue of National Geographic. The first printed translation by William Tyndall was between 1525 and 1535, about 10 years ago. Uh, different Bibles and, and, and translations, all of these are AD. I got tired of typing A period, B period, so I got that. They're all in AD. Miles Coverdale translation. 1547. He was a friend of Tyndall and dedicated to Henry VIII in 1535. Dedicated in that Bible. The Matthews translation, 1539, possibly written by John Rogers, a friend of Tyndall. You start wondering, you know, what, what's the motivation of each of these people? I mean, uh, these people all sound to be English speakers. So it's not that they're translated into a language that maybe the Bible wasn't in, like German or French or Italian or any of the other languages. Tavaniers and the Great Translation, 1539. The Geneva Bible, 1560. That one comes up in this National Geographic article. The Bishop's Bible, that one comes up in there too. Basically it's called the Bishop's Bible because they got a bunch of bishops together and they wrote it. 1568, <coughs> Reims New Testament, 1582. Now that's the first one that was just the New Testament. And the Doye Old Testament, 1609 to 1610. Again, just the one book. King James Version, 1611. This is the most accurate according to scholar. It is probably the most favorite. And you have the English Revised Version, 1885, and the American Standard Version, 1901. Most of, I, have, I haven't had a chance to go through this whole article. I may bring some of this up another time in the future, but uh, this, is, this is the stuff that I find so fascinating. Uh, 
National Geographic says the extraordinary global career of this book, of which more copies have been made than of any other Bible in the language. The work was begun in 1603. And the situation went along that uh, this was after the reign of Queen Elizabeth of England. So the Queen Elizabeth I. And it was the moment when she passed away finally, and uh, her cousin and heir, the Scottish King James VI, had been waiting for uh, waiting for for a long time. Scotland was one of the poorer kingdoms in Europe and had a weak and feeble crown. Uh, England, by comparison, was civilized at this point. It was fertile, it was rich. So when James heard that he was at long last to inherit the throne of England, it was said that he was like a poor man, now arrived at the land of promise. See, in the 16th century, England had undergone something of a yo-yo reformation. They were fighting back and forth between Protestant and non-Protestant. Uh, this is most well known to us today, uh, partly as Ireland. North Ireland, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom and the rest of Ireland is independent. And they had the orange people who were Protestant. I have to think about that because I remember orange because Protestants are orange, O P. Okay? Catholics are green, C G. So that's the colors we use. And they were always fighting and they fought for many, many, many years. And basically they still are, but not quite as blatant. So this was a big problem that he had. In this situation, two competing visions of the Holy Scriptures. The Geneva Bible, as I mentioned, published in 1560 by a small team of Scots and English Calvinists. Now you might understand or know that Calvin, John Calvin, is basically the founder of the Presbyterian side of uh, the uh, denomination where John Wesley was the founder of Methodist Church. Okay? Now, don't get confused. Christ is the center pope. Christ is the column that each denomination uses in their Christian denomination of faith. Okay? But Christ has not been with us since he was crucified and, and arose after being with the uh, disciples for 40 days. Right? So he wasn't here to physically start the church. Human beings, people, had to do that. Okay? And these are some of the people that have done some of that. I had a person from one particular denomination tell me that their church was started by Christ. It's based on him, but it wasn't started by him. So, uh, the Calvinists uh, in Geneva, they drew on the pioneering translation by William Tindall, who I mentioned also in his translation. Matthew's translation. Uh, oh, yeah. The first printed translation. It was the first printed translation. The first one that was put into print in a book using movable type. Uh, that thing where you brought it down and squeezed it in place and printed on a page. 
That guy was martyred for heresy in 1536. I gotta look that up, see what, uh, what the situation was there. Anyway, set against it, the Elizabethan church had produced the Bishop's Bible. Uh, we talked about that one too. And rather quickly translated by a dozen or so bishops in 1568. Translated quickly. Mm -hmm. And pointed how accurate it was. It had a large image of the queen herself on the title page. So Geneva's grounded form of language, cast thy bread upon the water, was abandoned by the bishops in favor of obscure pomposity. pomposity. They translated that phrase as lay thy bread upon wet spaces. So here you go. Here you go. This is an example of a difference being made in the translation for a purpose to present a different outlook, to give something some impetus or, or input to, to make something stand out. Uh, this can be seen again in my NIV Bible. In Matthew, when Christ is giving everyone in the Beatitudes, uh, uh, when he's talking to everybody, uh, he gives them the example of praying to God in the word prayer. The word prayer is not actually a prayer, it is a guide to prayer. <clears throat> Christ taught us this so that we would understand how to pray to God. And we might cover that in one of our Bible studies. That might be something good to do because it is rather interesting. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, doing some stuff on the Ten Commandments. And there are a couple of things interesting. But anyway, the last verse of the Lord's Prayer, as we learned it in the King James Version, I in school memorized it and got a little pocket, New Testament. For it. In the Life's Application Bible, there is a footnote after the next to the last verse that says, the last verse, the scholars cannot determine whether that was actually spoken by Christ or added later for emphasis by someone else. So that's the second of three reasons why. The Bible does have this thing. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, the divided inheritance that King James wanted to mend. He was having problems with this, and he wanted to mend it for the other one. And a new Bible would do it. So, round rules were established by 1604. No, continu uh, no contentious notes in the margins. Uh, which can be found in printed Bibles. I know of very well known pictures that when the Bible was printed, there is a notation in the spine that says, whoever's changing this Bible, stop it. No language inex inaccessible to common people. We talked just a few minutes ago. Common people didn't have access to Bibles. They didn't have the true and accurate text, driven by an unforgivingly exacting level of scholarship. So to bring this about, the king gathered <clears throat> an enormous translation committee, some 54 scholars, divided into all shades of op opinion, from Puritan to the highest of the high churchmen. Six subcommittees were then each asked to translate a different section of the Bible. So, King James Version, and, and there's still a lot more for me to even go through. I, I should have started it earlier, but I didn't have time. Uh, there's a lot of story there. This portion of studying the Bible itself is worth a lot of research. It's just fascinating. Okay. So, more discoveries that came along. 
Revised Standard Version, 1952. Now we're getting into, I was one year old. Uh, some of you might not have been around yet. New American Standard Version, NASB, 1960. I remember when that one came out, because 1960, I was, uh, New International Version, 1973. Yeah, I remember that very clearly, <coughs> because 73, I got out of the Coast Guard and was back home going to college. And uh, I uh, got back involved with the church and uh, came about this, and it's, it's my favorite. Uh, it, it reads well to me. I understand it well. I like the way it reads. New American Standard Update, 1995. The English Standard Version in 2001. Uh, even though the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, Greek, and about 1% Aramaic, our Bible has been produced in many languages over the years since it was first spoken by God to the men that wrote it down. Uh, we're in a church where 75% of the individuals that are here speak, read, write, and understand well their first language, Korean. And there are Bibles upstairs that are Korean. My wife had us them. She has some that are Korean only. She has some that are Korean English together. Uh, we have song books up there that are in Korean and English. So there's one language. I know China. I know Chinese. Uh, I don't know which one because there's so many dialects, but uh, uh, I would imagine uh, some Mandarin probably. That's Cantonese. And Cantonese. Those are Do you two. speak Chinese? No. Oh, no. okay. I, I, I speak Chinese. Ah, okay. Just like a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I speak enough. <laughs> I speak enough of everything to get my face stuck. That's not it. But uh, I know the Chinese. Uh, uh, I know, of course, German and French, Italian, Spanish. I mean, all of them. I think I don't. I don't. There may only be a, just a few obscure languages that they don't have it uh, published in at this time. I, I I believe there may be uh, one or two uh, American Indians. Language. Uh, but it is in a lot of languages. Uh, languages of the Old, uh, Old Testament time, this is interesting. Uh, they start out with <coughs> Semitic language, but not the oldest one spoken. Sumerian, a unique language, there's no known language family and no resemblance to any other known language. So uh, it was written using cuneiform characters. I described that as a piece of wood that looks like a golf tee, and they push it in different directions into clay, and that forms words, letters, and words. And there are some other things. There's uh, one that's a stick that has a kind of a V pattern, and you push it in with a line. These things all make symbols that mean words, and that's how they did a lot of Sumerians, did a lot of recording. I mean, they were uh, addicted. They were addicts to recording information, and there's so much of it out there. There's something like over 33,000 different clay tablets in cuneiform. Earliest evidence for Semitic language uh, goes back goes back to uh, the third millennium. That's three thousand years BC. It is distantly related to the Hamitic family of languages, which also includes Egyptian. So now we're starting to mold some. The languages together here because all languages come off of a tree. Okay, that's another thing I find fascinating linguistics. Wow, there's some cool stuff in there to see where English came for. It didn't just pop up, that's not something that was used in the time of Adam and Eve or 
not until more recent times. These split into the Semitic and proto Hamatic, which gave rise to the Egyptian branch. Amito is a Semitic language. In the Semitic side, we have Ugaric, Moabite, Moabites, Moabs, uh, we're talking uh, Old Testament Bible times here, Moabites, Aramaic, we know Aramaic, that was Jesus' language, Hebrew, which is what the Jews speak today, <clears throat> and that's on the Southeast Semitic side. Arabic is also an old Semitic case. Okay, structure. Okay. But remember, Muslims did not come about until Muhammad wrote the Quran. Before that, some of them were Jewish and came out of them. Just as Christians were actually first Jewish and stayed Jewish for a short period of time before there was a split and they came off out of it. Because Jesus was a Jew. Probably the perfect Jew. I remember running across somebody one time uh, on an emergency call, multiple call, and my engineer came over to me. He said, you see those two people sitting over there? I said, yeah. He said, I can believe this. They just told me that Jesus was a Christian. But no, no, he was Jew. That's what he grew up as. That's what he knew. That's what he confessed. But from him, through the disciples, came Christianity, <clears throat> originally known as the way. Hebrew was the language of the north and the south kingdoms of Israel. Uh, for quite a long period of time, everything from Jerusalem up was Israel. Everything below that was Judah. And of course, they had two kings, so they competed. They had problems with each other, all of that stuff. It was used until the time of the Babylonian captivity. When the language of the court, Aramaic, came more and more to replace it. Again, not everybody knew Aramaic. When the Jewish people came back around 536, the Hebrew language had undergone some very significant changes. Aramaic words uh, have been added to the vocabulary. Uh, their alphabet has changed from old Hebrew characters to the newer square Aramaic script which uh, is the form still used today. And there, there comes in another problem with translations is some of this stuff is no, is comes from so far back that there are very few people today that know it. Uh, and, and as time moved forward, fewer and fewer people were uh, trained or literate in some of the languages. The Aramaic was moved out. So that's another one of the problems that comes uh, into being. Uh, after the fall of Jerusalem, 70 AD, the dispersion of the Jews, the Hebrew language used in the synagogue to read scripture ceased to be spoken. Hebrew remained a dead language. It was known only to scholars until the 19th century. After the Zionist movement in Europe, was the language revived as a spoken language. And then the language is still used today with words added for technology, but still virtually identical. A lot of languages uh, have problems like that. Technology is difficult to uh, be able to put into some languages because it doesn't have any way to fit in. Uh, if you know anything about 
the Navajo code talkers in the Pacific Theater. They use them in, in, in the <coughs> European theater too, but Pacific theater is where they were mostly known for. Uh, and they used their language, which was not written. And they had uh, words for things like bird. Well, there's nothing that they have that could possibly do anything to explain or name an airplane. So they used the word bird. If it's a falcon, it's probably a fighter. If it's a duty bird, it could be a bomber. Turtle is a tank. And that's how they kept the Japanese from figuring out what they were saying. So that same kind of thing happens here. Okay? Same stuff. Not, not, uh, not really. That, that's really a different. Aramaic, not to be confused with Arabic, is a Semitic language used by Neo Babylonians of the time of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure everybody knows that name. He didn't, if I remember correctly, he didn't quite like hanging on to the, uh, was it him that got the uh, ark? Or was that, uh, no. The ark was stolen one time and they sent it back pretty quickly because only priests can carry it. They can't touch it, but they can carry it. And anybody else that tries to carry it ends up dead. There's a couple of stories in the Bible about that. Talking about the language most commonly spoken in Israel in Jesus' day, and in fact, the language spoken by Jesus himself is Aramaic. This is why Mel Gibson chose to use that in his film, The Passion of Christ. And I thought that was great because that really lended a, a, an air of this blossom. The language of the New Testament was entirely Greek, except for maybe 1% Aramaic. The Old, Old Testament traditional text was known as uh, Masoretic, is because the Masoretes were Jewish scholars who worked diligently between the 6th and 10th centuries AD to reproduce, as far as possible, the original text of the Old Testament. It was not uh, their intent to interpret the Bible, but to transmit to future generations what they regarded as the authentic text. We did, however, add vowels. Uh, <laughs> the Koreans did that too. They only had consonants, if I remember correctly, and they ended up having to add vowels. Because a lot of words don't work without vowels. Okay? So they had to add vowels to the text to explain the correct pronunciation since the original text only had consonants. And that's basically the reason for it because it makes your speech much better understood. The earliest complete copy of the Masoretic text of the Old Testament is located in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's public library written about 1,008 AD. Dead Sea Scroll, one of my favorites. I, I have books on these. And uh, it's such a fascinating thing. The earliest copies of the Old Testament books are found in the Dead Sea Scroll. These books were discovered in 12 caves in 1947 by sheep herders near Qumran, which, if you know anything about that, is where a Jewish sect called the Essenes. Yeah. They date prior to 70 AD. If I remember correctly, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls have every book of the Old Testament except the Book of Ruth. The Septuagint, translation of the Old Testament into Greek, made in Alexandria. Egypt, about 250 BC. There are several versions. The Codex Semanticus, which I, I studied, 4th century AD, fascinating. Codex Alexandrinus, which I've also uh, studied, 5th century AD. Codex Vaticanus, 4th century AD. I think that's the one that's uh, hidden 
down in the archives and they don't want to see it. I don't know. What is this? Samaritan Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament. We learned that the very first night. Pentateuch literally means Torah. The Old Testament, New Testament in Syriac is an Aramaic dialect. The Vulgate, a Latin translation of the Old Testament and New Testament made by St. Jerome around 400 AD. Vulgate, Latin. No, we can look closer at the nature of the translation and textual criticism and alterations in a future Bible study. The Apocrypha comes from the Greek and means hidden things. The word is used in three different ways. First, for writings that were regarded as so important and precious that they must be hidden from the general public and preserved for initiates, the inner circle of believers, okay? the ones that might become priests. Second one, applied to writings which were hidden, not because they were too good, but because they were not good enough. This is because they were secondary, questionable, or heretical. Now, if we're talking about the Apocrypha, the books banned from the Bible, we're talking about this, okay? And there's two or three of them that I looked at that I can kind of see where they were coming from on those. Books which existed outside the Hebrew canon is the third one. These are books that the Jewish people did not accept as scripture, but appeared in Greek or Latin. And this brings up a situation that relates to the documentary hypothesis. I just spent a lot of time just trying to tell you something about it. I mentioned it the first night. This was developed by a German scholar by the name of Wilhausen. The documentary hypothesis is widely accepted by biblical scholars and is the theory, notice that in bold underline, theory, which means it has not been proven. Theory found in popular literature, such as encyclopedias, magazines, and newspapers. So here it is, people of today, trying to tell us about things in the Bible and who wrote what and why and how and so forth. So I've looked at this, I find it fascinating, but that's it. Most evangelical scholars reject it. Why do they do that? Documentary hypothesis makes the Pentateuch a lying fraud. Now that's one bad thing. Second one, there is no objective evidence for any supposed source document, hence a theory. So pick you use your interest, look it up, documentary hypothesis, give it a read. Uh, if you've spent a, lot, uh, a good amount of time in your Christian belief, you'll see things pop out right away, you'll be going. Right? Some titles of the Bible. The Bible, a book or scroll, became known as the book. The most read book in the world is the Bible. A canon is a Greek word for rule. It came, uh, it came to mean scripture. <clears throat> A canon, I really think, is used mainly word wise by the Catholic Church. Scripture. And I think most Christians use the word scripture. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. John, 7th chapter, verse 38. The writings. And from infancy, you have known the Holy Scripture. 
which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. The word of God. This one I love. And we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accept it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Anyone that wants a copy of these PowerPoint, let me know. I'll send it to you. Me or email it right the law, prophets, and psalms. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the psalms. Luke chapter 24, verse 42. The believability of the Bible. We've already spent a lot of time in this. I would spend too much more time on it, but ordinary men wrote the scripture. Two fishermen, John and Peter, a tax collector, Matthew, he obviously was literate. Most of them were ordinary men. The Bible is internally consistent. I already went through this, I believe, in the first uh, lesson. Uh, it's uh, the story in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 about uh, Sennacherib and Hezekiah and the 30 talents of gold and the 300 talents of silver or 30 talents of silver. The Bible actually says 30 gold, 30 silver, but some records of Sennacherib, just as records from Hezekiah were found in his uh, counting books that he did turn over 30 talents of gold and 30 talents of silver to, silver to Sennacherib. But Sennacherib's records of the transaction say 30 talents of gold and 300 talents of silver. And so, of course, people that don't bring it, believe the Bible are all automatically going, wait, wait, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's not the same, that's not the same. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We have to take in the context the time that this occurred. And it turned out that the exchange rate, in other words, the rate between the American dollar and the euro, or the American dollar and the yen, or the won in Korea, or the American dollar and the pound. They are different. You don't get one dollar in US and one pound in England, in Britain. The pound is worth more, okay? It's about $135 right now, uh, you looked yesterday, to a pound. 1.35. 1.35, I'm sorry. $1.35, excuse me, I'm sorry. I read it that way when I'm a bad brain. No, not me. Dyslexia. $1.35. It's not the same. You know, uh, what was it? Uh, it's running about, uh, I wasn't from the year, I wasn't from the year. Well, dollars aren't the same. No. The Jamaican dollar is like... Well, that's true. It's like 30 to 1. And yeah. So Australian dollar. dollar. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the point here is this. In that time period, the, the uh, gold was such a quality on both sides that it was even. So 30 talents of gold from the Jews to the Assyrians uh, was still 30 talents. However, the Jewish silver was a much purer silver than that of what Sennacherib has. So when it was exchanged, 30 silver talents from Israel was worth 300 silver talents in Sennacherib's town. That's why it was different. The Bible was not wrong. It didn't get it wrong. It was right on the money. So keep that in mind. Don't let people fool you off on things like that because that's 
That, that's what they try to do. Okay, that's what they try to do. They try to sell you something. Tell you if you don't wear cotton completely, that they'll kill you. Yeah. Uh, take a look at that and then Google it. And see, I think you'll find it interesting. But ah, we're almost there. Ooh, I might make it. Whoa. <laughs> that's on you. The Bible is a powerful and dynamic book that has not only changed the lives of millions of people, it also convicts God's people of sin and leads them down the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Bible has had more influence than any other book ever written. There's a story in here in the beginning of that National Geographic talking about a man by the name of uh, uh, Rome Wager, U A G E R. And he's a cowboy. And he was a cowboy. Okay. If you've watched enough Westerns, you know that cowboys are not always good guys. John Wayne, yeah, a couple others, but most of the time, you know, they're out on the trail with a bunch of cattle for three months and they get to town and they want some fun and they're not always completely ethical and all that stuff. So anyway, he was a cowboy. He uh, was raised on a ranch in South Dakota and he found that his life was empty as a cowboy. Exciting, but empty. So he was looking for meaning. And one day in the drunk tank in a jail in Montana, which only had about 10 people then, he found himself reading the pages of the Bible. I looked at that book in jail and I saw them then that he established me a house in heaven. He came into my heart. And he took it from there and became pastor or preacher. Later. And that is a lot of times how it happens. The question is are you listening? <laughs> the Bible is historically accurate, giving Credible evidence for creation. I got three books at home on creation versus uh, yeah. very interesting. Uh, good reading. If, if any of this, you know, makes you say, "Hey, I'd like to," let me know. I'll I'll send you a picture of the book, and you can go look for it. They're good books to have around with you, uh, uh, and they come in very handy if you do research. Oh, no, they're good. To me, books are it. Okay, I love books. I need a T-shirt that says, "Lead me not into temptation," especially because I've only come out of one, and I didn't buy it That's because I was doing security and I wasn't allowed to. Books. You want to know something? Books. They're accurate. There's, the Bible is historically accurate. Give incredible evidence of creation, fossil records, archaeology provided evidence that over 80 people that are listed in the Bible do in fact exist. They found archaeological evidence. People say all the time, especially scientists, well, you know, that uh, that story about that uh, flood thing, you know, that 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 was that didn't really happen. Yet, two things that I've seen on documentary. What? I think it was the naked archaeologist. I know it's not what firefighters think that is. You gotta watch them. Uh, the guys aren't, the guy likes for people that don't know anything about archaeology to understand it, so he likes to bear it naked to, to, to show it so you can understand it. But he had a piece and he came across some stones that were carved with these Kind of vortexes, they're you know, like this, and there's several of them. They kind of have a 
go like this. It's obviously pointing to water movement, like a river being parted. Yeah, don't tell me that that is not true. But how about this one? This is even better. There's a man that does archaeology, and he got to look it in the, uh, the Red Sea. And guess what he found at the bottom of it? A lot of military hardware, including an intact chariot at the bottom of that water where the Jews exited. Now tell me that's not true. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. 80 people. Huh? And I believe uh, archaeologists found some bones of the Nephilim. There have been a lot of bones of the Nephilim uh, have been found. They were giants. See, it comes out that giants were upon the earth, and the Bible tells us about it. But it's only been recently that this has come out. He is absolutely correct. Problem is that most of the bones, they take pictures of them, but then they get confiscated by the government. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, definitely. Uh, we can talk about that sometime if you're interested. It's very fascinating. Uh, it really is. Uh, I've run out of a little bit of time, but I've only got three slides to go. So you can look at the one. Probably. Uh, 80 people, I mean, Jesus Christ himself confirmed the believability of the scriptures. Jesus believed in the law and the prophets, Matthew 5, 17, 18. Believed in Jonah, Matthew 12, 40, 41. And believed the historical narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah, which they have found, by the way. And there's a very plausible answer to, uh, where the fire and brimstone came from. I won't put it into here, but anybody's interested in the hour, so you know. Fascinating. It has to do with cuneiform. Oh, they found they uh, uh they they've always had uh Jericho. I mean, they knew where Jericho was, they've been there with it, but it was a while back that Archaeology was digging down the walls and they found a level of ash and fire on the wall. Interesting. There are various prophecies concerning the Messiah that confirm the believability of the Bible. <clears throat> the birthplace of the Messiah was predicted 700 years before his birth, saying that he would be born in Bethlehem. Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, fulfilled in Luke 4, 7. Christ would be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, fulfilled in Matthew 1, 18, 25. Christ would be born, uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was predicted 700 years before it occurred. Prophesied uh, in Zechariah 9 9 and fulfilled in John 12. Verse 12 and 15. Christ's crucifixion uh, and uh, suffering were also prophesied 700 years before fulfillment. Psalm 22 14 to 18, fulfilled in John 19 23 to 37. And it was also prophesied in Isaiah 53 4 to 7. And fulfilled in Matthew 26 to 63. Like I said, some of this I've read a little fast. If you'd like to have a copy of it, just say the word and I will email it to you. You just have to have a PowerPoint. Each of these prophecies can be used to help you strengthen your resolve about the believability of the scriptures. Okay. Uh, I hope that we have given you some. Excellent information on the Bible, on its believability, on where it came from, why we have it, who wrote it, 
giving you some direction on how to find a way that meets your needs to study it, to read it, to learn it. There's a lot here. We've covered a lot of information these three nights. Uh, we may end up going through some of this again in the future. Uh, maybe with a little more in-depth information. Let us know. Let us know what you're interested in. Let us know what you'd like to see. Okay? Uh, we're open for suggestions. We've got this to take uh, take us for a while, but then we'll have to come up with something else. And there are several things that we're thinking about, but hey, you know, we'd like to hear from you. You'd be much more interested in something if you're interested in it. Uh, so that's all I have. I want to ask Dave Carlson to give us a uh, closing prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you uh, help us to retain the knowledge that you have given us for you to study. And uh, we thank you for this word. Amen. Amen.